Thank you for checking out this talk from the Fierce Families Conference that took place back in October of 2023. Our mission for this conference was to put God's design for marriage and family on full display, and then to equip marriages and families to live out God's beautiful design in the context in which he's placed them. So if you'd like to learn more about the Fierce Families Conference, perhaps to attend a conference in the future, or to bring the Fierce Families Conference to your own area, just go to fiercefamilies.com. Um, so as Desiree said, we're going to be talking uh, much of this morning and specifically during this first talk about biblical womanhood and what it means to be a biblical woman. Um, I think we all know that right now in our society, there is a lot of confusion about what it means to be a woman, about gender in general. Um, so just out of curiosity, I did a Google search to see what would come up when I searched just like definition of womanhood. And so I want to read for you a couple of examples of the things that I came across. One woman wrote, to me, being a woman means tapping into a power that cannot ever be taken away from you. I learned what being a woman means the day I realized the world will never spin in my favor. And for that reason, I must always affirm myself that I am powerful, I am worthy, and I am deserving of every sweet thing this world could offer. Another woman shared that being a woman means I can be anything and everything I want to be. It means being able to fight for change and raise my voice on behalf of those who can't, and standing alongside other women to show that they matter, not being ashamed of crying when only a good sob will fix it, laughing like I'm five years old, feeling vulnerable, and being proud of those vulnerabilities, loving myself despite all my flaws, and accepting myself for the person I am, trying to make myself a little bit better every single day. And one more, finally. To me, being a woman is strength and empowerment. It is black and white, cis and trans, straight and queer, native and immigrant, disabled and poor, and Jewish and Muslim and fat and all-inclusive. What I'm trying to say is being a woman is whatever you want it to be. So honestly, I don't really know exactly what point that last woman was trying to make, and I'm not sure that she does either. Um, but as I poured through these definitions that I found online of biblical or of womanhood, uh, the words of Romans 1:25 just continued to echo in my mind. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, because these women have chosen to be their own gods. Uh, if we look at just the small example of the qualities and the things that we see these women doing, it feels overwhelming and exhausting. They are tapping into power, affirming themselves, fighting for change, raising their voices, and making themselves better every day. When they make their own God, they also fall into the trap of the gospel of the self. And in this gospel, they've got to get up every single morning pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and find the power to cope with a world that is completely and utterly broken and sinful. They've got to do that all on their own, right? Um, so no wonder they're so passionate about all these strivings. Uh, but their striving, unfortunately, is futile. Reading these worldly definitions also reminded me that as Christian women, we also sometimes miss the mark of what it means to be a woman of God. I can't tell you the number of times that I have been told by very well-meaning Christian women um, that if my kids are fed and alive, then I'm doing my best, right? Um, and as much as it would feel really good to give myself a pat on the back for meeting that very low standard, uh, it's just not true that that's my best, right? And I'm not saying that there aren't certain uh, seasons or days or uh, circumstances that make doing the bare minimum very difficult, right? Um, my last pregnancy was particularly difficult, and there were actually several months where I could not feed my children. Um, so I understand that there are certain things that are going on that make doing these things difficult, uh, but I, I just think that God had more in mind for us than the bare minimum every single day, right? In general, if I'm waking up and my goal is just feed my kids, keep them alive, and then do what I want with the rest of my time, I'm missing the mark, okay? Um, I've also been told that I really do need to find more time for rest, uh, particularly when our kids were three, two, and one. Um, it was a crazy season of life, and I'm not saying that I wasn't tired, because the dark circles under my eyes certainly proved otherwise. Um, but what I am saying is I did not need any encouragement to find rest. Uh, my body longed for that every single day, and I had to fight against my sin to keep going and not be lazy. I didn't need encouragement to rest. 
Um, I'm saying all of this to show that in an attempt to spare feelings towards one another or to show grace or even to give ourselves grace, we've, uh, we've weakened, we've minimized the call that God has on our lives. Um, and in doing so, we're left with a weak picture of womanhood. Uh, we are stronger than this, ladies, okay? Uh, as women of God, we don't have to resort to the self-righteousness that we see in the feminist movement, and we don't have to resort to pandering encouragement that is not anywhere close to biblical. Because the world is so flighty and thrown about by every wind of change, I really want to give you guys something solid, something to ground you in as women of God. So listen to the words here, if I can find my spot, in Ephesians 2, 8, and take courage. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. Praise Jesus that every single one of the action words that we see in those verses are placed upon Christ. We are the passive recipients of his grace, his love, and his salvation. And the yoke of that gospel, the true gospel of Jesus, it is easy and it is light. And we see in Matthew 11 that here we will find true rest for our souls. And this rest, it's in clear juxtaposition to the strivings that we see of feminism, but it also holds us to a higher standard than the selfish excuses we often give ourselves to slack off. Here's the key. Biblical womanhood is hidden in the work of Christ. He will accomplish the work of womanhood in us and through us. So rather than continually creating and recreating ourselves, we can look to him. We don't have to give ourselves excuses to slack off or be lazy we can look to him. So when we're trying to determine what a biblical woman is or what womanhood is in general, the best question to ask is not what is womanhood, it is who is God and how has he called us to live as women? Let's go ahead and pray before we jump further into the word of God. Father, we do thank you for your word. Um, we thank you for Jesus. We pray that you would be here with us this morning, that you would give us your spirit, you would keep us from error, and that you would help us uh, to speak and believe the truth. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so in answering the question of who is God and how has he called us to live as biblical women, we need to first start and make sure we're all on the same page here understanding who God is. So I'm going to spit out a few verses here. Let's look to scripture. God is all-knowing, Psalm 139. All-powerful, Genesis 17. Omnipresent, Psalm 139. Holy, Psalm 99. He has given his own perfect son to save us from sin and death, Hebrews 9. And his son, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of his very glory. Right this very second, he is upholding the universe by the word of his power, Hebrews 1. And apart from him, there's no God. This is who we're talking about, the God of the universe. But he's not just out there floating somewhere in space completely irrelevant to our lives. Our lives are lived quorum Deo, before the very face of God. Psalm 33 says that the Lord looks down from heaven, he sees all the children of man, and from where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. Let's let the enormity of that sink in for a moment. Everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we say plays out before the face of God Almighty. This is both a fearful and a life-giving thing. It's fearful because God's perfect holiness demands obedience from us. And it's life-giving because, unlike the women that we talked about earlier, we have his word, his holy and inspired word, that tells us exactly how to live and exactly who we are. We also have his spirit with us every step of the way, guiding us as we seek to live up to his call. Scripture abounds with passages that specifically talk about womanhood and how we're to live we could literally talk for days about this topic, uh, but I want us to rein it in and focus on three overarching themes. The first is that a biblical woman fears the Lord. The second, and where we'll spend the majority of our time today, is that a biblical woman walks in truth. And third, we're gonna look at how a biblical woman serves sacrificially. So hopefully, at this point, we're all on the same page here about how this is primarily a talk about how we as women can live rightly before the face of God. Um, we're not gonna be looking at questions about whether women should engage in income producing work outside the home. We're not gonna be talking about what kind of clothes we should be wearing. 
um, important topics, but when we ask those questions that way, I think we miss the point altogether. Um, but that's a different topic for a different day, right? Um, that being said, we should just rip the Band-Aid off and jump into the stereotypical women's text of Proverbs 31, okay? So just go there. Um, I'm not gonna be speaking solely from Proverbs 31, but a lot of what I have to say will draw from that. So if you have your Bibles out, it would probably be handy to have them open to that passage. All right, so number one, a biblical woman fears the Lord. Proverbs 31.30 tells us that charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. This fear of God is an anchor for us. It provides a firm foundation for all of life. When we rightly fear him, we are convinced that there is nowhere for us to go but into his arms to escape his wrath. And it's paradoxical that the one who could smite us in a millisecond is also the only shelter that we have. You see, when we fear the Lord rightly, what we really fear is a life without God without his protection from our own sin, a life that is thr thrown to and fro uh, by the various passions of our own flesh, a life that will be judged by God, but with nowhere to hide. John Piper, when speaking of the fear of the Lord, puts it this way. The fear of kindling God's powerful wrath against sin ought not to drive us away from God, but to God for mercy. If you're running from God because you fear him, you don't fear him greatly enough. And this fear, it doesn't leave us cowering in a corner, hoping that we have ticked all the boxes and done all the right things to fend off God's wrath for that day. No, it leaves us safely planted at Jesus' feet, where we can find shelter from the ramifications of sin and death. It also keeps us from departing from the ways of God in order to find fulfillment for the longings of our heart in the world. And we're flooded with these temptations to look for fulfillment uh, outside of God, every single day, right? Um, we're told that we'll truly be happy when we have more time to ourselves or when we take that big vacation. Um, we are told that we don't really have to pay attention to our sin. We can excuse it because of what our Enneagram number says or what our Myers-Briggs letters are, right? Um, side note, I'm an introvert on the Myers-Briggs scale and I used that for a very long time to excuse lots of things that should not have been excused. Um, so. We're tempted to excuse our sin. We're also absolutely bombarded with the idea that self-love and self-care should be of the utmost importance, even at the cost of those around us. If we are not grounded in the fear of the Lord, we can easily fall into the gospel of self, and that striving is futile, just like the women that we talked about earlier. The hope there is vain. The fear of God results in true fulfillment as we cling to his word. We know that the God who demands perfect holiness from us looks at you and at me, and he is satisfied because he sees Jesus. What more fulfillment could we ask for than to know that we will have eternal communion with our God, the one holy God? We need to preach this gospel to ourselves every single day. Deuteronomy 6 tells us that he has written this gospel on our hearts and that we are to teach it diligently to our children and talk of it when we sit in our house and when we walk by the way, and when we lie down, and when we rise. In doing so, we're creating safeguards for ourselves when we're tempted to get off track. A biblical woman knows that this gospel keeps her safely in a position of fearful submission to God. The second characteristic of biblical womanhood is that she walks in truth. It's not just that she speaks the truth, although that is a large part of it, uh, but her life is characterized by genuineness and sincerity. There's two aspects to this essence of truth that exudes from her. The first is knowing the truth and walking in it. And the second is recognizing falsehood and turning from it. First, let's look at a few verses that describe how she walks in truth. 1 John 1, 5 says, If we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And again, in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. A biblical woman knows the one who is truth, and she patterns her life after him. He's the one who prays for us in John 17, 17, that we will be sanctified by the truth because his word is truth. And so she abides in his word, and this is the bedrock for her character. We can also see that because of who the biblical woman trusts in, she herself is trustworthy. Proverbs 31, 11 says, 
the heart of her husband trusts in her. The people around her find comfort in the genuineness of her spirit. As 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5 says, she is not concerned with the braiding of hair or gold jewelry or the clothes that she's wearing. Um, she is concerned with the gentle and quiet spirit, which is inside of her. And Peter isn't saying here that braids are bad or that gold jewelry is bad or that it's not okay to have nice, cute clothes, right? But what he is saying is that this woman isn't putting up any fronts. She's not concerning herself with her outward appearance in order to cover up what's lacking inside of her. She's not obsessed with the latest Instagram makeup trends, and she's not throwing out her closet every few years when a new style trend comes around. She's concerned with her soul and the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. So where does this kind of spirit come from? It comes from a heart that is at peace with God. And this was always a little bit confusing to me because although I'm an introvert and I'm shy, quiet is not necessarily a word that the people closest to me would use to describe my personality. Um, I didn't really understand how a quiet spirit should work itself out within my life. I did not know what it meant to be quiet. I thought it meant that I needed to talk less, but that was missing the mark, um, and I'm not very good at that. So a gentle and quiet spirit comes from someone whose soul is contented in God. I can still remember the exact moment that this concept really clicked for me in my mind. Um, it was my first time participating in our church's abortion outreach ministry. Uh, we were standing out front of Planned Parenthood and reading scripture out loud and pleading with women to come talk with us about their concerns and their needs. But as we were doing this, other women were driving by, um, and the women more than the men, overwhelmingly, um, yelling obscenities at us, making vulgar, vulgar hand gestures, uh, and making sure that we knew that their body was their choice. Uh, the overwhelming thing that I noticed in these women was a lack of peace. I felt compassion for them, but I also realized that this was the antithesis of a gentle and quiet spirit. The feminist movement in general uh, has been characterized by rage and turmoil. They press on towards a fairly ambiguous set of goals, thinking that once these things are finally achieved, they will be free and they will have peace and they will have comfort. Uh, but the reality is that only God can provide contentment. And peace with God is the source of this gentle and quiet spirit that we see within the biblical woman. This makes her someone that others intuitively know that they can trust. And you all know what I'm talking about here, right? We know those friends in our lives that we just feel safe with. Uh, you might even be thinking of someone right now that when you're with them, it's comfortable and it's easy and it's nice, right? Uh, for me, one of the first people that comes to mind is my cousin's wife, Julie. Uh, she's one of my dearest friends, and in the almost two decades that I've known her, I've never heard her say, not even once, a bad word about someone else. Um, she hardly ever complains, and she is the best encourager that I've ever met in my life. When I did have three young children under three years old, she kept me going a lot of days, speaking truth and encouragement into my life. Um, and a few years ago, she had breast cancer at the age of 37 with two very small children. Uh, and I was devastated when I got this news about her, but she was still full of hope and joy in the Lord. And this isn't to say that she didn't have really bad days, because she did. She had really, really hard days. Um, but she never questioned God's goodness, and she never turned to self-pity. Julie has peace with God, and she's one of the most trustworthy women that I know. And to be called trustworthy is not a trivial thing. In today's world where we boast of our busy schedules in order to get out of social engagements that we really didn't want to go to anyways, right? Um, where people are viewed as commodities for what they can add to our life, where productivity is valued over personhood, this woman is refreshing. Is that you? Is your life so characterized by the gospel of Jesus that the people around you, your husband, your children, your friends, they find comfort in your presence. Another reason the biblical woman is trustworthy is because she speaks truth. And a side note here, when I say she speaks truth, I don't in any way mean that she speaks her truth. Um, people, often women, go around slinging malice and hatred in the name of self-expression and speaking their truth. Oprah Winfrey is often quoted as saying, I know for sure that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool that we have. And we can all recognize the ridiculousness of that statement, right? 
Um, because speaking my truth is really only an excuse to say whatever I want without assuming any responsibility for the consequences of what have been said. Change that quote to, I know for sure that speaking the truth, capital T, is the most powerful tool that we have, and then we have something we can work with. Our speech is intended to glorify God, not ourselves and our feelings. Often when my kids are in the middle of a squabble, I'll tell them, God gave you a voice to glorify him, and if you choose to use that for sin, you're going to lose the privilege of speaking for a little bit. And sometimes I think that, I know me, but probably all of us could use a little time out from speaking to see if what we're saying is actually truth or if we're just venting our feelings. Regarding speech, Proverbs 31:26 states, she opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. The two words that characterize the Proverbs 20, 31 woman's speech are wisdom and kindness. I would die if those words were the characteristics that people use to, care, uh, to talk about my speech, right? That's the goal, because wise speech is by its very nature true. When discussing the topic of speaking truth, R.C. Sproul states, if you are of the truth, if you have learned the truth, if you see the sanctity of the truth, then speak truth. We are not called to be deceivers or liars. God is a God of truth, and his people are called to have an enormously high standard of truth. This is the high standard that the biblical woman holds her speech up to. Okay, so we've talked about how a biblical woman knows truth and she walks in it. Let's look at the other side of the coin now and talk about how a biblical woman recognizes falsehood and turns away from it. The world is full of lies about who we are as women and how we are to live, but this is not something new. We like to think that it is because it's so overwhelming and pervasive right now, but we see in Genesis 3, right out of the gates, Eve is being deceived by the serpent, right? Falsehood coming straight at her. My husband frequently says to me as he's walking out the door, I'm praying for you today to believe the truth and that the Lord will keep his serpent out of my garden while I'm gone. I don't think that he prays this because I'm a particularly gullible person, <laughs> so I hope not. Um, but I think that he knows, that Satan knows, that if he can sink his lies into the hearts of women, he can take down the whole family. Think about the messages that the world is telling us. That we will only be happy and free when we take down the patriarchy. That our children will get in the way of our goals and dreams. That putting effort into serving those around us and tending our homes is a waste of our talent. And that homemaking is nothing more than a series of menial tasks that will leave us unfulfilled. Ladies, these are lies straight from the pit of hell. They are not truth. And a side note, when I say homemaking, I don't mean just someone who stays home and tends her home. We are all homemakers, right? Whether we go out and work and come home or we stay home all day, we're all tending our homes. We're all creating and cultivating here. Uh, the truth is that we're called to be cultivators of beauty and order and stability wherever we go, whatever we're doing. Proverbs 31, Titus 2, and Genesis 1 are all rich with instruction for women to tend our homes with tenacity and strength. It doesn't matter if we're married or single, parents or without children, stay-at-home wives and mothers, or women who work outside the home. Our call does not change. Cultivate a life and a home that reflects the goodness of God. On the topic of what true homemaking is, Rebecca Merkel states, if God tells half the human race that they're in charge of tending the home, it flows from this that this is actually one of the most important fronts with which the world will be one. Our call is not small and meaningless, women. It is high and it is holy, and there are enormous consequences when we don't rise to it. A biblical woman knows this to be true, and she lives her life accordingly. The lies of Satan are potent and prevalent, we must remember the truth of what God created us for. Another more subtle falsehood that even discerning Christian women oftentimes fall into is that we should follow our hearts. That each and every one of our emotions deserves to be fully explored and entertained and tended to. Uh, what this boils down to is letting our emotions be our God. Emotions can certainly be sweet gifts from the Lord, but they must be used properly and kept in their proper place. A friend of mine, Haley Grapenthin, who lots of you know, uh, she does a beautiful job of discipling her children in the area of recognizing truth 
and rejecting falsehood. She shared with me an analogy that has become uh, a common reference in our home. And the analogy is this. Uh, We can think of our emotions as horses that God gave us as a gift. These horses are good and they're beautiful and we get to ride them in the path of truth. But sometimes our horses get spooked and they start barreling towards a cliff. And when this happens, we've got to pull on the bridle and get them back on track. Our kids are six, five, four, and one, and there are a lot of big emotions in our house, okay? Uh, Often when one of them begins to spiral, I'll tell them, get your horses under control. And I'm not gonna lie, there are usually multiple times a day when I say to myself under my breath, woman, do not ride your horse to crazy town. We are not going there today. By way of example, let me share with you a time in the recent weeks when I almost rode my horse off a cliff of anxiety until my dear husband put me back on track. A few days ago, I was talking with him about some concerns that I have for one of our children. I was calmly explaining the facts of the situation, but the more I talked, the more my horse started to go a little bit to the left. And then all of a sudden, things took a sharp left turn as he listened patiently and I started just rattling off (laughs) Ridiculous statements like, uh, he's going to think I don't love him, and I don't know how to help him, and I don't know what to do, and so he's not going to like himself, and then he's going to think no one likes him, and he's going to have no friends, and he's going to be all alone in the whole world. And my husband, Henry, he very calmly said, yeah, none of that is true. Um, And so after a quick laugh at myself, uh, we proceeded to talk about the truth of the situation. Thank God for husbands that rein us in. Um, A biblical woman knows what to do with these big emotions when her heart is overwhelmed. She takes them straight to God, whether it's anxiety or self-pity or anger. Psalm 61 says, From the end of the earth I call to you. When my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge. When we resist the temptation to be emotional tyrants, we don't just stuff our feelings, we take them to God. And Hebrews 4 gives us the comfort of telling us that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, even our weakness in controlling our emotions. But in every aspect, he has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, not sheepishly and embarrassed, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. A biblical woman knows that in order to fully walk in truth, she must take these big emotions before the throne of Jesus, and he will turn them into beautiful fruit in our lives. When I was explaining this analogy of the horses to my six-year-old a while ago, he sat thinking for a moment, and then he said, so God is the bridal, right? And I'm telling you, I could have cried tears of joy hearing that he actually understood what I was trying to say to him. So when your emotions get big and they feel overwhelming, pull on the bridle and take them to the throne of Jesus. And walking in truth is not just something that happens because it sounds good or we know that it's something we should do. It requires vigilance and guarding and self-examination always. But what a sweet, sweet promise Jesus gives us. In John 8, he says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The last theme of biblical womanhood we're going to discuss is that of selfless servanthood. And it must be stated right from the start that Jesus is our greatest example of selfless servanthood. He served to the very point of death for you and for me. I love this excerpt from a prayer found in the book, Every Moment Holy. It's a prayer about serving others, and it starts, O Christ, who made himself servant of all, I would set my heart and my affections upon you and upon you alone. For I can only serve others rightly when such service is undertaken from first to last as an act of devotion offered to you. Obviously, Jesus is the standard that we should strive for above all else, but I do want to consider the Proverbs 31 woman as well. I think a lot of women become discouraged when we look at the Proverbs 31 woman because, honestly, she knows how to do a lot of things that we don't, or at least I don't. And it looks like she can do everything without the need to sleep. And I love sleep. So let's look at just a few of the things that we see her doing. Verse 13, she works with willing hands. Verse 14, she brings in food from afar. Verse 15, while it is yet night, she provides food and portions for her household and her maidens. Verse 16, she considers, buys, and plants a vineyard. Verse 17, her arms are strong. Verse 18, her lamp does not go out at night. Verse 20, she reaches out her hands to the needy. And verse 24, 
She makes linen garments, delivers them, and sells them. And I am tired just reading that, right? <laughs> and my tendency is to think that she is doing all of this without any struggle. But I don't think that's what the Bible is telling us. It doesn't offer any commentary to us about her emotions. It just tells us that she obeyed faithfully. She did what she was called to do. And when I make her a real person, someone who struggles to do the things that she's called to every day, then I feel hope about my ability to do this as well. She has no magic formula for perfect service with a perfect attitude. She's rising early, she's going to bed late, and she's working all day. Of course she's tired. It's very possible that she has the same inclination that I do, that when her alarm goes off, she wants to hit the snooze button. She has to lay herself aside over and over every single day, and that is no easier for her than it is for me or for you. When I make her this real person, I feel that I can too lean to the Lord, trust in him, just as we see her doing. And the secret to how she's doing it is not a secret. It's spelled out for us clearly in verse 30, right? Right where we started. After all of her accomplishments and her accolades are listed, we find that the fear of the Lord is the key. She can serve others without concern for herself because she fears the Lord. She can work though her body is tired and exhausted because she fears the Lord. She can love and support her husband without wondering what she's going to get in return because she fears the Lord. Radical service like this to others will cost you everything. And when you think you have nothing more to give, it's going to demand even more. But in dying to yourself, you will be sanctified in Christ. We also see that she is not working to find rest at the end of the day. She's not hurriedly marking off her to-do list so she can have some me time. Proverbs 31 does not end with, and then she put the kids to bed early so she could have a glass of wine and scroll Instagram for two hours. In her book, Even Exile, Rebecca Merkel comments, too often we just accept the premise that a homemaker drives carpool, gets the casserole in the oven, and organizes the closets. Once those things are done, we feel like we've ticked all the boxes and now our time is our own. It's all too easy for us to work in order that we may have rest. Rather than working because we're convinced that we're building something phenomenal. And that mindset makes absolutely all the difference in the world. Ladies, the work that we are called to is difficult. But it is worth it. It is painless and often thankless, but it is never once fruitless. The call to selflessly serve those around you and lay down your life for them is producing more glorious fruit in me and in you and in those around us than we could ever imagine. And seeing that the fear of the Lord is what compels us to this selfless service, we find ourselves right back where we started, with the need to daily remind ourselves that our lives are lived quorum Deo, before the very face of God. In closing, I want to leave us with a quote from Elizabeth Elliot. She says, we are called to be women. The fact that I'm a woman does not make me a different kind of Christian, but the fact that I'm a Christian does make me a different kind of woman. For I've accepted God's idea of me, and my whole life is an offering back to him of all that I am and all that he wants me to be. So as we go forward and we seek to be a different kind of woman, let us first fear the Lord because any other position before him will end in our demise. Let us walk in truth because Jesus himself is the truth and truth is what the world needs. And lastly, let us serve sacrificially because this is what Jesus has done for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word that's gone forth. We pray that you would use it to produce beautiful fruit in our lives. Bless our efforts as we seek to faithfully live up to the call that you've given us. Thank you. Amen.